Right. Um, Pastor, uh, Pastors Matt and Lisa are not here this morning. They are in Oregon. Um, Pastor Matt's preaching at a church over there. And thank God, because Oregon, Oregon needs it. And uh, <laughs> including the Trailblazers and the Seahawks. I mean, it's just, it's the judgment of God, really. It's the eighth seal. Um, I don't know either. I don't know. Um, and so he texted me this morning. He's praying for you guys at church, and um, he misses you, and he'll be back soon enough. But um, I want to talk to you today about the greatest battle and fight that the Bible talks about, that every single person who's a Christ follower um, is in right now, regardless of if you're aware of it or not. And, um, yeah, so we're going to dive into this today. Now, before we do, um, let me just tell you a story, and then I'm going to give you some context, and then we're going to jump in. Um, I, I loved um, playing outside growing up. We played wiffle ball uh, like every day and dunk hoops. And, uh, you know, I usually raise it to 11 because I had, you know, I'm 11 feet high because I can jump at sixth grade a lot. But uh, I, um, we played airsoft. We played uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, tackle football in the backyard. And uh, we loved when it snowed, you know, kind of like here it snows a lot like every few years. Um, it, when it would snow a lot in Vancouver, where I was growing up in our cul-de-sac, we'd have snowball fights. And uh, one of our neighbors, his name was Kyler, and um, I walked outside and realized, that, like, I didn't get the memo that they were having a snowball fight. So I quickly run inside, get on my jacket, I run back outside, and I literally, as I'm just running, and I grab some snow, and I pack it in real, real quick, and I grab a big one and pack it in. It's not fully, you know, it's not all the way packed, but it's, it's good enough. And I, and I just, I throw it at Kyler, and it, it hits him, and he starts crying. And it's like, dude. And, and he's yelling at me and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm like, what, what, what? And he's like, you hit me in the head. I'm like, yes, yes, I have great aim, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, it's like there's a rock in there or something. I'm like, stop. I just have a great arm. And literally looks at the ground, and there was a rock about this big that was in the middle of it. And uh, so, yeah, um, it was, it was, we were to fight. But I, I, I want to talk to you about a, a fight you may not be aware of. Um, maybe intellectually you, you, you're aware that there's a battle going on. Um, but we're, we're going to actually look at what this battle is, what it's about, and what we can do about it um, out of the book of Ephesians. Now, here's the context really quickly. Um, I have a theory Okay, this isn't my theory. I'm definitely not smart enough to come up with any theory. Um, but I, I, I think this theory to be true. Here, here it is. Um, Ephesians is part of what we call the prison epistles. So epistles are letters written to churches. And um, yeah, the prison epistles are uh, essentially letters written to churches while Paul is in prison. Now prison it, in the Greco-Roman world at that time was not viewed as a form of punishment. It was um, where, you, where you were at just as you were awaiting trial. If you stole from somebody, you had to pay them back. That was your form of punishment and some. And uh, you'd be in prison just, and, and oftentimes you'd be actually, it would be like home arrest in a sense, and you would be chained to a Roman soldier. And, um, and when you weren't doing that, there was these houses with, you know, it was kind of access to the sewage, and the, the sewage system they had. At the bottom there was in the, of the ground, there was a hole, and there was no light or anything, complete darkness. You're on the, you're on the ground. And they would drop you in there with other people, and that was, that was prison uh, for them. And so um, it was not a pleasant sight. And the Apostle Paul, this guy who goes around starting churches, um, he finds himself in prison a lot. So, um, yes, there are consequences to doing bad things in life. There are also consequences to doing godly things in life. I think that we should make that, a note of that real quick. But um, Paul's in there, and here's the deal. If you look at the books, First and Second Corinthians, Paul is talking about stuff that's happening in the church and the sin they're messing up with. One dude is sleeping with his mother-in-law, and it's just like, okay, wow. You know, you think this church is bad. You, you, you haven't been to that one. And so... There's all this wild stuff. They're kind of, they're kind of, you know, they're extremely immature biblically, but they have, you know, they, they're they're very gifted spiritually. And Paul's to correct them, and then talk about the ascension of Christ and the resurrection and all these different things. And he's addressing specifically what's going into that, what's going on in that church. 
But the book of Ephesians is written to the church of Ephesus, but it doesn't address any of those things. It's very generic. It, it's, it's not talking about what's happening in Ephesus. It's not addressing certain sin or issues or disunity within the church. It's just pretty generic. And here is, here is the outline of Ephesians and why I think it is the way that it is. Ephesus was the most cerebral city of the known world at the time. And they had tons of people there who were scribes. And I believe Paul knew that the letter to Ephesus could far reach the known world faster than any of his other epistles. And so what do you do if you're going to write a letter to a bunch of churches? You're going to write a little bit more generically. You're not, you're not going to address that one church per se. You're going to address the church. Okay? And so here's how it works out. In the very first chapter, the whole thing's poetry. And, and it's, it's, it's doxology, and he's, he's praying to God, and he's praising God, and he's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. we got the whole trinity in the first chapter. And then the second chapter, it's like, hey, you're saved by grace through faith, and you're created to do great things uh, for God before the foundations of the world. And then, you know, and then in, uh, from two to three, it talks about how Gentiles are now grafted into um, Israel, and that this is the great mystery of the gospel, is that anybody who believes on Jesus, this is what this is the book of Romans, anybody who believes in Jesus, they are the seed of Abraham, they are true Israel. So we are, the, we are Israel, we are the remnant of God on the earth. And he has grafted together both of these groups into one, and there is no wall of hostility, no distinction between us. We are one in Christ Jesus. And then he gets to chapter 4, and he says, listen, some of you guys, you need to take off your former manner of life, your old self. And we would call that the flesh. That's what Paul means by the flesh. It is your past desires. It is your, it is your previous passions and your previous idols that you had in your life before you come to know Jesus. And so he's like, you need to take that off, and you need to walk in newness of life. And then he talks about the gospel implications. You need to pay people their fair wage and allow them to work. You need to do this. Don't, don't be bitter. Don't, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Don't give a foothold to the devil. And then we get to chapter 5, and he talks about three relationships. And he talks about masters and slaves. And then he talks about parents and children. And then he talks about husbands and wives. And then after all that, he goes to talk about what we know as the armor of God, the armor of God. And I just wonder if Paul is sitting in prison, chained to a Roman soldier, and as he's sitting there and he's writing to the church of Ephesus, he's looking at this Roman soldier in his armor and he's thinking about how you're only dressed for armor when you're in the military, when you're going out to war, and he starts to think at the end of the letter. I just want to remind everybody, don't be so loosey-goosey with this stuff. You're in a battle. Let's talk about the armor you should put on. And he actually draws upon the book of Isaiah where it talks about the armor of God, that God has his armor. And so this armor he's going to tell us about is tested. It's tried and true. It's God's armor. And um, he's using this metaphorically to say, here's how we win in the battle. And so we're going to dive into it today. Hopefully that's okay with you. And uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse, verse 10. And we're going to just go through and break some of this stuff down. Now, I can't, trust me, I cannot stop everywhere in this passage, and I cannot touch on everything because we would be here for 18 hours. Amen. And you don't want that, and neither do, neither do I. So let's, uh, we're going to hit a few highlights here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you have extinguished all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all um, perseverance, making supplication for all saints. 
Okay. I, um, I'll be married for five years this May. And uh, I know, hold the applause. Hold, wait. <laughs> We've made it. And uh, our uh, seminar is coming out soon. We've made it. We figured it out. We have got the algorithm down. And so, um, trust me, we're going to make some money. And uh, when our book comes out, it's going to be called Marriage. F uh, no, actually, the joke I'm about to say is not funny. So, and we are online. Welcome, YouTube, the world. I already get called a wolf in sheep clothing enough online. So, uh, let's just, let's. Okay, so <laughs> I remember um, when I got engaged in November, um, and we were going to get married in May, and I went up to my brother, and I'm like, hey, we need to get in shape, and we need to work out. And I'm sure my brother was thinking, I think you do, <laughs> because I was getting married, and he was in good shape. So, <laughs> But he was like, of course, yes, let's do it. You know, and I'm like, all right, let's go. So we, we get a membership at this gym, and... Uh, we start going, and it's just funny to me. I know this is every gym, but it's just funny to me if you think about it. There's mirrors everywhere. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Got to check your form. Got to check your form. Okay, I get it. But, like, I just would see people there on a machine face the mirror that way, straining their neck just to watch their back as they're, like, doing a leg machine. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> like, and I also hate it because I was really trying to get into shape, um, and I mean, it had a shape, it, just not the shape I was wanting. And I, and I would see people there who were just like ripped out of their mind. And I just would be like, why are you here? Like, go home and eat Taco Bell or something. Like, go lay on a bed of donuts. Like, what do you, it's like, it's like you have a perfectly fine car. It's a 2022, whatever. And you just keep going to the mechanic, you know? And it's like, yeah, we get it. You have a Ferrari, get out, you know? So I, I just think it. And so we, we, we did that for a few months, trying to get that wedding bod. And, um, and I think I lost over the course of three months, two pounds, which could have been water weight for all I know. And when I think back about on that, um, I got less and less consistent over time. And I never really changed my eating habits, you know, which I guess matters. And, um, you know, like I just, there was multiple things. And when I think back about it, I go, I didn't really have an effort problem at the beginning. I just had a focus problem in the long haul. You know what I mean? Like I had zeal. I had passion. I use how some people are with books. You've started like a thousand books. You know what I mean? You finished like three. And so like we have this passion to start. And over time, I just, I, I, I wasn't focused on what the goal was. I still had passion. I lacked focus. I love that Paul says at the beginning of Ephesians, he says this, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Keep alert. In 1 Peter 1.13, the apostle Paul says this, or not the apostle Paul, the other apostle, Peter, he says this, therefore preparing your minds for action. Think about that, preparing your mind for action. Check this out. This idiom, which is often re rendered as gird up the loins of your mind, refers to the ancient practice of men tucking their robes into their belt when they needed to move swiftly and quickly. This idea that Paul's trying to get us, get in our mind is, you need to be alert of this battle. You need, you need to be aware of this. Have you ever um, been driving and you think to yourself, I don't remember the last 60 seconds of driving. <laughs> so how many of us in here are a hazard to society? Okay. 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 Yeah. Well, we're actually gonna be doing prayer at the front afterwards. <laughs> and if you don't come forward and you drive, we will stop you. So probably won't remember it though. And, um, and I'll, I'm like driving. It's because I'm like going places I, I go to every day. And it's like, I'm aware, like, like, obviously I'm watching where I'm going, I'm making turns and whatever, but I'm not like fully alert, you know, and I'm just kind of cruising, but I'm, I'm not like paying full attention. I'm not really totally aware of my surroundings. And I just wonder if this is Paul's charge at the end of the book of Ephesus, where this is what maybe some Christians are looking like. They know the turns, they know the route, 
church at 11. We're going to go to Gray's afterwards. It's our routine. You know, like we, we have like, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And we know the turns. And we're kind of going through the motions. And we're not, we're not alert. We're not actually aware of what God is doing and the battle that's happening in the spiritual realm. And so I want to talk about some of these different things that Ephesians 6 lists. And we're not going to hit all of them. And we're not going to go into depth on all of them, but a few of them here. And then I'm going to end with some concluding thoughts. And it's, it's going to be amazing. Just, okay, it's just, it is. Hopefully. All right. First one's this. He says to be strong. That translated literally means to be strengthened is the idea. It doesn't say to be strengthened by the Lord. Hear me on this. It, it does say this, to be strengthened in the Lord. Not by the Lord, in the Lord. I want to contrast two people in scripture for you real quick. Um, I want to contrast the construction of the tabernacle of Moses. The tabernacle was like a mobile temple. And um, so they had tents and all this stuff. And eventually, it, you know, they had moved to a temple, a permanent dwelling place for God. But Moses is, you know, he gets the out assignment. And I want to contrast that to the construction of Solomon's temple. Okay, here's the difference. Moses built the tabernacle with God for God. Solomon built the temple for God without God. It is possible to do a lot of things for God and not with God. And, and, and we're not actually going to be strengthened in the Lord that way. It is union with Christ that actually strengthens our faith and our life. It is not service for him, but life with him. And life with him leads to service for him, absolutely. But how many know you can do a bunch of things for somebody out of obligation? It doesn't mean you're living life with them. And I'm, and I'm, tell, I'm here to tell you, if you need strength today, it's going to come from union with the God who gives grace to empower you. And it's from that place that you are actually in a place of strength where you can do things for God as well. The next thing he says is the belt of truth. This is not truth as in scriptural or theological or doctrinal truth, but truth um, more so in, in truthfulness. You're living a truthful life. This is the context of Isaiah that Paul is referring to. In other words, moral character Moral character. And this would always be the first thing that the soldier would put on because it held the, the breastplate in place. It gave, it, it gave a, a spot to put the shield into and it held everything together. It was the first thing. The first priority when it comes to this battle is making sure that we are living a life of integrity and that we are living a life of righteousness. That we are not a different person on, on stages that, than we are in the shadows. That we are not two-faced in that sense, although that Batman movie was good. But we have a fully devoted heart to Jesus. That we, have, that we are people of God. Not that we do all these things first and then we allow God to develop us. No, that we, we, we wear this belt of truth that we are truly Jesus followers. It's, it's the first thing that we put on because it holds everything else together. The next thing is the shield of faith. The Roman shields were they're shaped like a door. They'd be anywhere from four to, four to five-ish feet in, in, um, in height. But the word faith here doesn't mean simply trusting in God. I mean, it does mean that, includes that, but there's a, there's a bigger picture here. It means faithfulness to God, loyalty, dependence, or allegiance. And Paul says that it's the shield of faith that's going to block and quench the fiery darts of the enemy, our dependence and our allegiance upon God. You know, Israel never did well with blessing. They, never, they, they just didn't in the Old Testament. If you read through the story... And what would happen? They would, they would begin to turn to other gods and other powers other than Yahweh, the God of Israel. They, they, their allegiance was not to Yahweh at times, to God. And so he had to say, come back, repent, return. And they would go, God, we're sorry, we realize we... And, and, and they, they would go, God, we give you our allegiance. You are our God. We're not switching teams. And that's what God's after. 
That's what God's after in our life. No idols before him. No idols before him. And here's what's, here's what's interesting, is that the Romans had a system of locking these large shields together for their corporate defense against their enemies and for attack. So they would actually lock, they had, this, they had created this system to where, where they would lock shields and they would either stand the ground or they would push forward uh, as part of the battle line. And, um, and, and that's why community and the church is so important. And um, I, let me just say it like this. Oftentimes, um, when we talk about church and community, and I'm not, I'm not referring to our church, I'm just talking about kind of culturally speaking, um, we talk about church this way. You don't have to be a Christian to go to church. Church is just, it's like it'll help you grow. You get encouraged. You, you know, you get some accountability. You get to do life with other people. You, you don't have to go to, you don't have to be a part of the local church to be a Christian. You know, that, that's if you personally believe. Um, you don't have to do that, it, but, it, but it will help you grow. Well, that, that, that's sort of true, <laughs> and it's sort of not true, um, because when Scripture commands something, it's not a suggestion from the God of the universe. <laughs> I command you, <laughs> yes, King, do not neglect the gathering of the saints. And can I just tell you this? Um, one of the desert fathers in the 5th century said this, a Christian by himself is no Christian. And the, the enemy knows that Christians in isolation are vulnerable, more vulnerable than the, to the attack of the enemy on their life. He knows that. He knows that. Now let's just talk about this for a minute. Because some people, they maybe take this idea a little overboard. And they talk about the devil like uh, he's on equal playing field with God. God, the devil is not all knowing, not all powerful, and can't be everywhere at once, but God is. Okay, there's, there's one devil. Now, there are other evil spiritual beings. There is one devil. And ju just because you can't find a parking spot when you prayed for 10 minutes on your way to the ball doesn't mean you're under attack. You know what I mean? <laughs> and if you have unrepentant sin and you keep falling into the same habitual sin and you won't cut off a relationship or go, I'm not going to that place because I just can't. I, I keep falling into temptation. That's not the devil. That's the flesh that you need to die to. So let's not think here that, you know, I, mean, I remember one pastor telling me this. Um, don't flatter yourself. The devil can only be at one place at one time. He's probably not attacking you. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I don't know. I got a prophetic word that God had a call in my life. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah okay. But there is... There is real enemies. There's a, there's a real battle. There's a real spiritual battle. And the church, the church is so vitally important to Jesus. It's his bride. It's his, it's his woman. You better be careful what you say about his woman. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can tell me you don't like my shirt, that's fine. You can tell me you don't like me, whatever. You, you want to say something bad about my wife, I, I, I will flip a switch in my mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I can't handle that. No, I'm not going to pull a Will Smith there. I was just, I, 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 I am a pastor. Um, I remember my basketball coach um, used to uh, say this. He said, um, if you take your open fist like this and you punch the locker we were in the locker room after a game he says you punch it he says your fingers are going to break he goes but if you punch somebody with a closed fist you will break their jaw <laughs> the point being is this weakness and strength and god has actually designed us in for the battle to do it together to do it together um, last, uh, two more here, the sword of the spirit. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. The word there, there's two words in Greek for the word word. You try going with me? There's, um, the word logos or logos, and then there's the word rhema. Um, 
Rhema means a situationally applied scripture. Or I could say it like this, a prophetic application. Have you ever been reading the Bible and something stands out to you and you're just like, God wants me to do that. that that's, it's like it's highlighted, but it's not. And you're like, that, that can be a rhema word. Now, that doesn't give us license to rip every verse that we find out of context and go, oh, Abraham was blessed like that. Lord, I'm applying that to my life today. You know, I would like all the blessings. Give it to me. Like we don't, we don't get, we don't get to just rip, but God can give a rhema, a, a prophetic or situational application to a scripture for us. And this, this is what he's saying. The prophetic declaration or application of the word of God, the rhema word of God is the sword. It's the only off offensive weapon we have. Can I just tell you something? The devil knows the Bible better than you. So the goal here is not that you come on Sundays and get a little inspired and you're like, I just want to know the Bible a little better. I mean, that's good, but, but nobody in here knows the Bible better than the devil. In fact, I want you to think about this. Jesus and the devil are in the desert for 40 days and the devil's tempting Jesus. And um, he's not tempting him with, you know, like the carnal things we might be tempted by. He, he is quoting to Jesus Christ the Bible. The devil's quoting the Bible to Jesus. You know, I love Jesus' response because every time he says this, the scriptures also say. Because we can just take any verse and just go, well, the Bible says this. Yep, yeah, but the scriptures also say this. And listen, listen, hear me on this. If you don't have a hunger for the Bible, you need to go home and pray to God and say, God, why is there not a hunger in me to know who you are by your infallible, God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired Bible? What is in me that is actually, it's actually deafening, it's deafening, and it's, it's hindering the hunger I should have to know your word. Man will not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I'm here to tell you today, we, need, we are going to be a church that is hungry for the Bible. We will not rely on culture and its 21st century tendencies and pressure points. It will not be on the philosophy of the French Revolution. And it, I'm telling you, it won't be any of those things. It will be on the word of God and his truth because the truth of God transcends culture and time and everything else. And the word does not change. The devil knows the Bible better than us. He just does not apply it and come under the lordship of Jesus and we need to be hungry for the word of God in our lives. <laughs> Try going to battle without an offensive weapon. And that's what some of us are doing. We're trying to fight spiritual battles with earthly weapons. And that's, you don't win that fight. You don't win that fight. Okay, last one here is stand. I wanted to save this one for the end because this is the... Um, most important word in Ephesians 6, 10 through 19. He says it four or five times. Stand firm. Withstand in the evil day. Stand your ground. You know, stand, stand. Like, just, he keeps mentioning that over and over repetitively, intentionally. But here's the idea. Here's the idea. The picture Paul is drawing is not of a, a church, a body, us. It's not of a march an assault or attack on the enemy, but of the holding of the fortress. Paul knew this. There are many great things you could do for God and still in the end, hear me on this, make shipwreck of your faith. And Paul knew that. Um, growing up, I mentioned this earlier, but we, d we did love to play airsoft and it was a lot of fun. And um, I tried to get my wife to, play with me, you know, sometimes and she doesn't want to, but, uh, and so it was fun until one day we accidentally with a CO2 airsoft gun shot my buddy Hunter's tooth out, which was funny and devastating, but we stopped playing for like an hour and then we went right back to it. So, um, 
And um, my dad had this tree fort that him and my grandpa had built. And it was, it was, um, it wasn't really a tree fort, I guess, because it was, there was posts from the ground, but we had this big, like, willow tree that, you know, went over it, and, um, and it was, like, painted on the inside with these, like, army soldiers, and there was a ladder that went up into it, and he had cut out, you know, these, um, like, windows so you could see out these square, you know, square boxes in the wall, and when we would play airsoft, and my brother and I against the neighbors, would be like, okay, the goal, first goal is to get to the fortress, to get to the fort, and we would get up there, and then once we were there, we did not sit down and just go, <sighs> game over. Like, we didn't, do, we were actively trying to defend the fort from our enemy who was trying to take it over. We had the high ground, you know, Anakin, I have the high ground, okay? That's a rainbow word for somebody right now, I just feel that <laughs> right over here. Um, and we would get up there, and, and the reason Paul is saying stand, not march, not run, is because Jesus has already won the victory. He's gotten the kingdom, and he, we've taken over the fortress. When Jesus comes on the earth, you got to think about this. He comes on the earth, and he's claiming kingdom. He's claiming there's a new king. He's always been the king, and he's here to establish his kingdom on the earth. And he says his kingdom was not of this earth. Stand your ground. The point is this. The Christian has no further investment in the outcome of the spiritual war because it's already been won. Other than to remain stationary. Why? Here's two reasons. Jesus proclaimed that he was bringing the power of the kingdom against Satan in Matthew chapter 12. And in Luke chapter 10, when the disciples reported that the demons were subject to them, Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, this has been, this verse has been used to talk about um, the devil or um, the technical way would be to say is the Satan because Satan is a, uh, a title, not a name. But um, that the devil fell before Adam and Eve, and now he's in the garden. And um, there, are, there are passages in Scripture that talk about um, that situation, but this isn't one of them. When Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning, he's referring to the coming of the king and the kingdom of God, and that he, you know, from every demon he casted out to every sick person he healed to the gospel proclamation and the, and the ascension of Christ, the kingdom is now here, and because the king is on earth, which was the devil's domain, guess what? He has fallen like lightning. The devil has been defeated, but not yet been destroyed. His tactics are different now. If you look in the Old Testament, he would actually influence nations. He, like evil, spiritual evil forces would use nations and ex external um, modes to try to come against Israel and God's people. Well, the devil has now been limited. He's a dog on a leash and his end is written already and it's coming. But until then, he's a dog on a leash. And Jesus says, he, the strong man has been bound. He's referring to the devil. And so what does he do now? He cannot, he can no longer use those external forces similarly to the way he did in the Old Testament. So he has fiery darts, schemes of the devil. Ephesians chapter 4 defines for us what the schemes of the devil are. You know what they are? Deceit and bad doctrine. Doctrine would be the teaching of scripture. Deceitfulness, lies, and wrong beliefs about God and scripture. That's his tactics. Okay, let me wrap this up and prove this to you. Um, prove it might be the wrong way to say it. Let me expound upon this. I'm going to show you two passages real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is Paul, same guy, writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. In other words, not human means. We, we're not, we're not, this is not a, a physical battle where I'm using shields and swords no this is something else but have divine power to destroy strongholds if you look up what he means by strongholds i believe it's the only place in the new testament that mentions that one word there were these towers with these massive walls and just get this picture in your mind people are hiding behind them and paul says we have come not with weaponry but we have come to take down that stronghold and here's how he does it for the weapon uh, next verse. 
we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Isn't this insane that the devil's tactics are thoughts, lies, and doctrine? I remember um, Dr. David Campbell, a professor at Theosu, he was sharing this story when I was with him a few weeks ago about how he was very discouraged and um, also depressed in a season, in a certain season of his life. And he went up to his pastor and was telling him about it. And he says, I feel disillusioned. And he said this to him, you aren't disillusioned. You were only disillusioned because you believed in an illusion to begin with. It is lies that creep in to hear that is how the devil's schemes work. Um, okay, one more story and then one more verse. A um, few days ago, I was outside doing some lawn care stuff, and uh, my wife was outside as well. And, um, you know, she's very um, detailed. I'm like, yeah, that's good. You know, she's like, no, no, that's not good. Um, and so yesterday, I'm outside with a screwdriver taking weeds out of the cracks in the sidewalk in front of our house. So, um, you know, I, I didn't see the need for it, but she did, and I just trust that God speaks through my wife. So um, a, few, a few days ago, I'm outside, and I thought I'd shut the back door all the way. It was cracked open a few inches, and um, I walk in the, back in the house, and there's ants all right there. And... Uh, you know what my wife didn't do? She didn't get mad at the ants. She didn't walk up to him and go, hey, I've asked you not to be here. I've paid people to make sure you don't come in here. She, she, she got mad at me. <laughs> Why? Because I, I left the door open to things unwanted coming in. I'm here to tell you today, without the shield of faith, locked in with other believers, it's an open door for the enemy, and, you're, and, you're, and, and, and I'm not trying to freak you out and going, um, oh, what's going to happen tonight? Like, you know, like, I, I, I'm saying this. It's an open door in here when we are not, we are not allowing the word of God to renew our minds, when we're not standing uh, shield by shield with other believers, extinguishing the fiery darts. Listen, I know that uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 19, Paul is using metaphor, um, a metaphor to really describe a reality, okay? And so... He's trying to convey this. Be alert, be on guard. There's an actual battle. He's been defeated, but the battle's not over. You need to stand your ground, stay in the fortress, guard it. Because this is the bride of Christ. He's coming back for a pure bride. And, he, and, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we have, we have to be alert about what, what is happening. We have to be alert. Last verse, 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve, this is a chapter later from what we just read, as the serpent deceived Eve, how do you deceive her? Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. I've never met anybody that had a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And in two days, see, I hate, you know, I don't believe in God, I hate Jesus, and I don't go to church. I, Maybe you're, maybe you know one person. I've just never met them. It's usually, it's usually from thoughts beginning to start circulating in the mind. It's like this. I remember, um, you know, laying in the pool, like half asleep. I, I opened my eyes two minutes later last summer, and I'm on the completely other end of the pool, and I didn't even feel like I was moving. I was drifting and I had no idea. Because when you're moving that slow, it's so slow that you're making progress, but you don't even recognize it in the moment. And so afterwards, you open your eyes, and you're like, man, look at the gap or the distance, you know, between where I started and where I am now. And, and I think that's how it works in our mind. We begin to just, there's a little bit of bitterness. We start, we start, we start looking to the wrong voices. We start, we just kind of, prayer becomes a secondary, it becomes the fifth wheel to the car. When, when, the, when, you know, when the emergency hits, we go to prayer. But, but we're not in the battle, we're not aware, we're not standing our ground. 
And what happens is we begin to just slowly drift from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And we begin to just start drifting and drifting and drifting and drifting. And then you look seven years later and it's like, look at the distance. And I'm here to tell you today, that's why God calls us to repentance. Repentance is not with the people with A-frames that shout at you on the corner of streets yell at you saying, do you want to go to heaven or hell? Repent. That is not God's heart at all. You know God's heart is with repentance? It is a call back to intimacy. It's a call to change your mind and to agree with God so you can align up with God. It's a call because God cares about you and loves you. And God wants to cause some of us to come back to repentance where we have deviated and drifted. Rat poison is 99% food and 1% poison because every lie is mostly true with a little bit of perversion in it. And that's always how it starts. It creates false dichotomies. If God is all loving, how could there be an eternal afterlife that? If God is this, then how, and, and we create these false dichotomies, a lot of truth, little bit of, little bit of perversion. And it begins to seep in. The poison eventually kills the rat, obviously. And here's what I wanna say. I think we should be gracious to everybody. I think we should have humility in our, in our, in, in the way we carry ourselves. I, I believe we should listen. I believe, I believe all those things. But it is no secret that there is a culture war, culture war, in our country. From everything to critical race theory, to the sexual agenda, from culture that is being shoved down or attempting it to in certain school districts for seven, eight, and nine-year-olds to, to the deconstruction movement that, that denies the um, divinity of Christ, all these things. We need to be gracious with people and, 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 and talk and learn and grow. But I'm here to tell you today, I'm here to tell you that we are called to stand our ground. We're called to say, the word has always been true. It's always going to be true. Either Jesus Christ rose from the dead or he didn't rise from the dead. But if he rose from the dead, if he rose from the dead, then his words carry authority. And if he is who he says he is, then I got to trust him. And if he's my king, then I submit to him. And if he says, you need to be a part of the family of God and be a part of the local church because the fiery darts are going to be coming at you whether you realize it or not. I don't get to disagree with them. And as the church, and listen to me, Easter is right around the corner. And we are going to have more people give their lives to Jesus on a Sunday and make a decision than we've had all year more people but here's what i don't want jesus is after lasting fruit and people are in a battle and they don't even realize it and we need to be a beacon of light a beacon of hope we need to be the greatest encouragers and we need to defend what god's word says because it's god's word we don't fight against flesh and blood people are not our enemy there is a greater battle And we gotta stand firm. And we gotta be who God's called us to be. Can we do that? Come on, let's stand to our feet. We're gonna worship one more time. We're gonna sing about how Christ is our firm foundation this morning as we did earlier. And we're gonna gonna declare this this morning because he's the only foundation. Jesus says this, if we build our life upon his words, it's like building building on rock. But if we build our life on anything else, like building on sand, and when wave and storms come, It demolishes it. Come on, we want to build our life on the Word of God, on a firm foundation. Can we do that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray you begin to speak to people, even right now. Just reveal things in them. God, not not to condemn them, but to bring them to a place of conviction, a place of repentance. God, we want to be a church that loves and a church that stands firm. God, give give, give us the wisdom to do that. God, if we've lost hunger for your word, the sword of the spirit, God, give us a hunger for your word. Increase our boldness and our courage so that many would come to the knowledge of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.